The bright moon shone over the sleepy village. It illuminated a picture a perfect scene. Quaint homes were dotted for more than a mile across the ridge of the Kennet Valley, looking out over the rolling farmland of the North Wessex Downs. They housed just a few hundred people. This is Bienham, Berkshire. It's 50 miles from London but, in 1966, it may as well have been a million miles from the 60s swinging in the capital. Back then, this little village had one primary school, a 12th century church, no shops and a solitary pub, the Six Bells. So it was to the pub that 17-year-old Yolanda Waddington went looking to buy a pack of cigarettes at 10 p.m. on 28th of October. Bienham was the sort of place where doors went unlocked. Why bother? Everyone knew everyone. But Yolanda's face was new. Having only arrived in the village from nearby Newbury five days earlier to work as a nanny, she must have drawn some attention that night. After buying her cigarettes, she stood in an oatmeal-colored jumper, her dark curtain of hair pushed back by a white headband, and smoked a single fag in the pub. Then, she stepped out into the night. It was less than a mile back to Hall Place Farm, where she worked. The next day, Farmhand Alfie Woodley found some clothing scattered in a barn on the farm. He thought nothing of it. The barn was a well-known spot for courting couples. Not long. After though, Yolanda's employer reported her missing. She'd failed to return from the pub. To the local police, the missing person's report was shocking. Nothing ever happened in Vienna. The most they had to deal with was the odd pub fight. As officers began hunting for Yolanda, the farmhand told his employer about the clothes in the barn. And on 30th of October, her boss, farmer Peter Jagger, went out looking for her on his land. Down near the barn, he made a horrifying discovery. Yolanda's body lay on its side, half submerged in a water-filled ditch. She was naked, but for a pair of socks. Her hands were tied behind her back her blood-stained jumper stuffed in her mouth. She'd been stabbed in the chest and back, but the superficial wounds hadn't killed her. Her death had instead been caused by the ball of twine tightly wrapped four times around her neck. Many of the local police had only read about murders in textbooks. Now, there was a dead teenager in their village and an actual murderer on the loose. Due to the remote location of the barn, it was felt that the killer had to be local. But who in this quiet, innocent hamlet could do something like this? Officers from the Met Police were immediately drafted in to help in the hunt. Everyone. Locals reeled from yet another tragedy. Was desperate to catch the monster in their midst. Statements were taken from more than 4,000 people in and around the area. Every single Bienham villager was interviewed. 19-year-old David Burgess was one of them. A bully who'd spent his school days picking wings off insects, David was bad news. An air pistol accident had left him with a glass eye and a menacing glare. The landlady of the Six Bells confirmed he'd been in drinking when Yolanda visited. He'd left the pub soon after her. The next day, he had scratches on his face and a cut to his finger. When questioned, he admitted recently losing a penknife of the sort found at the murder scene. It was incriminating. But the police needed firm evidence. Their tests showed some of the blood on Yolanda's jumper wasn't hers. But back then, blood screening was in its infancy. It couldn't be definitive proof of who had committed a crime, but could rule people out. So police launched a national first. A mass blood screening. All men in and around Vienna aged 16 to 60 were tested. Of the 200 in this group, just four matched the blood type found at the scene. None of them were David Burgess. He wasn't Yolanda's killer. All four of the men, including David's brother, John, were investigated, but ruled out, too. Police were at a loss. Six months later, on April 17, 1967, the investigation had just been wound down when two nine-year-olds left their Vienna homes looking for primroses. 
Yet Jeanette Widmore and Jacqueline Williams never arrived home with their flowers. On high alert after Yolanda, 20 police and a crowd of villagers were soon out scouring their streets for the girls. Surely, evil couldn't possibly strike twice? Yet, within half an hour, a searcher came across two tiny bodies in Blake's pit, a lonely disused gravel pit on the edge of the village. Jacqueline had been sexually assaulted and drowned, Jeanette's throat was slit. Locals reeled from yet another unthinkable tragedy. Children's bedroom windows were locked at night, plainclothed officers sat in the pub listening out for clues and neighbors viewed each other with suspicion. The murders were heard about across the world. Everyone was looking to be in them. And they all wanted justice. Police didn't have to look far. In the crowds that had been hunting for the girls was a familiar face, David Burgess. He'd gone on to talk to television reporters, even extending his condolences to Terence Williams, Jacqueline's father. It was suspicious. After all, David worked as a dumper truck driver at Fisher's Pit, neighboring Blake's Pit. He'd also been missing for 20 minutes around the time of the murder. Police hauled him in for questioning. His clothes were seized. On one boot, some blood was found that matched the blood grouping of one of the murdered children. In July 1967, just four months after the killings, Burgess was convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment for the murders of Jacqueline and Jeanette. But did Bienham still hold another killer? In 1968, while in Durham prison, Burgess made a brazen admission to prison officers. On three separate occasions, he confessed to killing Yolanda. When detectives arrived at the jail on April 3, 1968 to quiz him though, Burgess refused to repeat what he'd said. Instead, he taunted them, smirking, you'll have to prove it. The blood on Yolanda's jumper was once again tested. Yet again, it wasn't a match for Burgess. Police were back at square one. Time marched on. Yolanda's mother died without ever seeing justice for her daughter. The press clippings on the murders grew yellow, faded. But, to the people of Vienna, their lost girls were never forgotten, the town's innocence never regained. In September 1996, Burgess escaped from Lahill Open Prison in Gloucestershire. Did the villagers he'd once counted as neighbors, look over their shoulders after the news? Burgess was only recaptured 17 months later in February 1998, when he brazenly robbed a bank for £2,500. In 2011, Thames Valley Police carried out a cold case review of Yolanda's murder, due to advances in DNA technology. However, the cold case team faced an immediate blow. Yolanda's jumper, that had held the blood stains, had been lost in the 45 years since the crime. Yet the police refused to give up. They retested all the available evidence for blood that wasn't Yolanda's. New blood stains were found on a polythene fertilizer sack from the scene and Yolanda's white headband. The samples were tiny, but lab work had advanced incredibly since the initial investigation. This time, experts found that the blood matched David Burgess. In fact, they estimated that the likelihood of the DNA coming from anyone other than Burgess was smaller than one in a billion. Rock-solid proof. Police suspected that in the chaos of the pioneering blood screen back in the 60s, Burgess had got someone else to give his sample, or the blood had been incorrectly labeled. Either way, a mistake had left Burgess free to kill again. But would a jury believe it? In June 2012, a bored-looking Burgess, now graying and overweight, began a new trial at Reading Crown Court. The jury were told to disregard his conviction for the murder of the nine-year-old girls. His defense, Mr. Benethan QC told the jury, do not start off being so horrified that the man standing over there is a double child murderer. The temptation is just to say we know he's a monster, we know he killed them, Jeanette Wigmore and Jacqueline Williams, he must have killed someone else. Life is more complicated than that. As for the new DNA match, he told the jury not to be blinded by science. After all, hadn't it been wrong back in the 60s? But times had moved on, 
and this jury trusted technology. After 45 long, painful years, David Burgess was convicted of Yolanda's murder in July 2012. The now three times convicted killer was jailed for an additional life term, and ordered to spend a minimum of 27 years in prison. Burgess, 65, checked his watch and sighed loudly as he was told he'd be locked up until he was at least 92 years old. As he was led from court, he laughed loudly, the final petulant act of a heartless old man. After nearly half a century, Yolanda's family and the residents of Bienem finally have answers. Three girls died, an idyllic village was changed forever, but Burgess is paying the full price for his evil debauchery at last.